All right, good evening, everybody. So happy to see you all. My name is Heather Hart for the camera and everybody back at home. And welcome to Local Government Citizens Academy. We have a couple empty chairs still floating around. Help yourself to the spot. Thank you for coming out. This is our very special Missoula Water Administrative Building. And it's a little bit different because obviously there's a bit of a history that comes along with it that we will probably get a little bit of a taste of. <laughs> uh, a couple of people I really want to introduce. In the back we have Gwen Jones, my fellow counselor for Ward 3. And we have three people greeting most of you uh, when you came in. And uh, they were best from last year. We have Betty Robson, Casey Erickson, and Shane Stack. Shane Stack, if anybody knows that name, he works for the county as the public work public works director over there. And here in this room, we'll start with the city's public works director, Jeremy King. That's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> he came on as director February first of last year. And then within a couple of months was asked to step into the interim uh, director position for the development services. And when he was doing that, we had Dennis Bowman over here, who stepped up as interim public works director. And to his right is Brian Pencil. He is a giant teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they both are. Not Jeremy, but both of these guys are. And they, uh, they really make sure that the magic of Missoula really happens. We got the email. We know that paved streets and flushing toilets actually makes a quite a bit of a difference in our lives these days. And they are the ones who make sure that continues on. And then last but not least is Lori Hart. And she's the assistant to the public works team. And uh, she made sure I got in the building this evening. So, <laughs> it's a very important job. So, any quick questions? Okay. A couple of things. Megan brought in donuts. They're possible. So, please help yourself this evening. And the bathrooms are going to be down that hallway, as you all know. Once you see the water fountain, it's just going to be a little bit further down that hall and on your left. That makes sense. Before the break room. Water fountain, break room, bathrooms in between. That's how plumbing works. From what I understand. <laughs> okay. So without further ado, I'm going to let Jeremy take off. Okay, thanks. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, I get to just give a quick little introduction and uh, and I'll hand it off to the guys that really do the work. But um, Public Works is really about public health and safety. When we think about Public Works, when we think about our mission, it's really about making sure that we have things like good clean water, good sanitation, safe streets. So our mission is really centered around how do we deliver, um, how do we construct infrastructure, operate and maintain infrastructure that helps promote public health and safety. Um, public Works is composed of um, our three public utilities, the water utility, wastewater, and stormwater. And then it also includes our street division, which is composed of uh, traffic services, our communication shop, and, um, and our street maintenance division. And then we also have the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's full service. <laughs> so um, we also, Public Works also does a lot of work with other city departments. We collaborate and support development services, police and fire, parks department, health department, as well as other state and local agencies like, like the county, um, like Department of Transportation, Mountain Line. So we do a lot of work that's just that's outside of just our department as well. So it's a, it's a team effort, and you'll hear a little bit about that tonight. Um, I like to think about if um, mo most of what we do, most of the time, if, if you don't notice it, it probably means we're doing our job well. Um, and, but there's a lot to that. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that things function the way you expect them to, and you don't, you don't have to worry about it. So that's what these guys are going to tell you about. So I'll welcome Dennis Bowman up to tell you a little bit about the utilities. Thanks, Jeremy. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. So I'll get into the utilities, basically the stormwater, Missoula water. 
along with uh, Garden City Compost and the Wastewater Division. Um, the difference about these utilities here is that they're classified enterprise funds. You pay your water bill, the, water, the, the money we collect from you from your water bill stays in the department. It doesn't go anywhere else. It doesn't go, to, doesn't go to Bryan for streets or anything like that. So outside of, you know, we did some stuff with stormwater that we hired, and Brian will get into that, we hired a couple of guys to help out with snow removal. In the summertime, they do stormwater work. So it really works out more efficient collaborating between Brian and, and the utilities. So same thing with the wastewater division and the stormwater. So you end up paying your bill, the money stays in the department. So, and that money is used to do all the maintenance, take care of all the personnel, along with doing all the infrastructure improvements that we need to do. And I'll get into more some of the infra infrastructure improvements that we do. So we made, we made this little uh, emblem here, and you guys have some uh, uh, stickers along for it. Along with, um, we tried to get as many bags as we could. We got some um, Garden City compost bags. And then along with the bags is some other pamphlets and information. Um, we have our quarterly newsletter. What we do with that is that goes into the water bill, and we send that out quarterly. We try to update the, all the residents of the activities we're doing, not only on water and wastewater or stormwater, but also streets, anything in public works. Really trying to get the information out, the positive stuff that we're doing. Along with that is our, like our water quality annual report. We have to do that every year. Usually it's every uh, June. It's on the website also. And then information about the wastewater plant and the compost facility. So those are some of the pamphlets that we handed out at the fair this year to try to get the information out, the benefit of the, of the local utilities and the improvements that we've been making. So we come up with this little cycle, basically uh, stormwater, water, wastewater. Stormwater comes down, basically runs off the street, goes into the, the sumps. So the importance of cleaning the sumps that Brian's been helping out with is that to take all those contaminants that come off the street, it goes into the sump. And the sump used it as, ends up being like a filter, so the water will go through, those, uh, all the particles and that will stay in the sump, and then the water goes down to the aquifer. So then from the aquifer, the water department, this little water, ends up pulling the water out of the aquifer and provides it, pumps it into the system to our tanks, and then provides water for all the houses, along with fire protection throughout the city. And then after that, after you're done using it in your house, it goes right back out into the waste, into the sewer collection system, out to the wastewater plant. They treat it, take all that water and treat it up to uh, all compliance, and then we discharge it right back out into the river. So it's a complete life cycle of the water that, that ends up we use in the city limits. Start off with storm water. Um, Basically, stormwater, it provides for and maintains infrastructure for both surface and underground movement of water from rain, snow belt, and other weather events. Ensures compliance with state, federal, and local laws for stormwater management. The ultimate benefit will be ensuring Missoula has clean waterways now and for years to come. We, we are so um, beneficial to have the offer that we do have right here because it's so, it replenishes constantly, but it's, it's a lot of water in there, and if that ever gets contaminated, we'll be hurting. So it's really important that whatever, along with this, is that whatever gets dumped on the ground, any spills or whatever, you know, you've got to clean it up and protect the aquifer. Because if something happens like the mill site up here, if it ever, um, ever had problems, we had issues with white pine sash, there's still the, the plume over there, um, years ago when that happened, that did affect one of Mountain Water's wells over there, so they were no longer able to use that well. So that's the importance also of working with stormwater. We have the stormwater footprint. You all have the pamphlet and that that shows a little footprint. Basically, um, you know, trying to put the word out that, you know, it's not only vehicles that um, bring particles onto the ground and, and dirt and stuff like that, brake dust, um, oil dripping out, you know, if someone um, drops antifreeze or anything, but it's also what you put on your lawns. If you put a lot of fertilizer on your lawns, your irrigation starts up, well all that fertilizer and that's going to run down the curb and gutter into the sump. That has to be cleaned out. It's also with animal waste. Same thing is that you have to turn around. If it rains or whatever, you got a bunch of animal waste in your yard or whatever and it runs off, goes into, it goes into the sumps or into the waterways. So it's really important to try to get the public's effort to help out with that. 
Um, Bozeman ended up getting, uh, had a problem with, with one of their waterways is that because of all the people walking their dogs up on the trails or whatever, they had a problem with, the, with how the nitrates in the water went way right up because of the animal waste and they had to do some extra cleaning and stuff. So just trying to get everybody's participation on this stuff. So um, same thing, like I said, leaves grease behind, oil, fuel, brake fluid, rubber from tires, dirt, mud, gravel, or some other contaminants. So there's multiple things. You see on the other part that we have to do is that we have to go around is that we get, uh, some of the contractors have to get permits. So we have to send inspectors and that out there to some of these construction sites because if it's a muddy, dirty construction site and they drive off, all that dirt and mud goes onto the roads. And then we gotta clean it up. It ends up um, plugging up some of the sumps with all the silt and that goes on. So. Utility rate, the City of Missoula stormwater utilities rate pays for maintaining existing stormwater infrastructure such as sumps, detention, retention basins, stormwater drains, pipes, manholes, stormwater treatment devices, and drainage ditches, not irrigation ditches. So, you know, we have a, um, one of the containments down there at Karis Park, basically it takes all the stormwater that comes off up Higgins and some of the side streets it goes into there and takes all the trash out, it swirls around, takes all the trash out. So that way, whatever's left coming out of that is just basically water to be able to discharge into the uh, Clark Fork River. So one of the other problems that we have to run into is that if we don't get out there and clean that, the trash gets built up and then the trash will start um, dumping into the uh, Clark Fork River. So that's part of the maintenance stuff. Um, keeping Missoula streets clear from stormwater flooding. Provide operation and maintenance for Missoula levees systems, which helps prevent flooding, and in turn reduce flood insurance rates. Uh, we're in the process now working with the uh, federal authorities for um, recertifying our levees out here. Um, we've been asked, you know, do we want to recertify them or not? Well, if we don't recertify them, all the <coughs> properties that are affected by that levy that they show that could be flooded, um, basically your homeowner's insurance will go way up, probably double. So it's beneficial if we can keep maintaining these levies and also get them recertified. So we're in the process of trying to put them through the federal agencies to get them recertified. So um, that way it keeps the insurance rates low. How many do we have? I want to say five total, four, five, four, yeah. four or five total, yeah. Along with the county does too. The county mm -hmm. has levies and that they're, they're want to maintain. So one of the things that we're doing with the county is that we can pay to have our levies recertified, and the county can pay to have their recertified. But we're looking at that, is it more feasible that if we join together, could we both save some money? And you hire the same people to do the same levies. So it'll be beneficial. So I just got some information today, some prices and costs for doing that. So um, we're gonna be having meetings with the county. So that's some of the uh, public outreach and outreach to the other uh, utilities and counties and stuff like that see where we can work together to maybe save some money and get it done right. Does the Corps of Engineers do that? I think it's Corps of Engineers and I think DNRC is involved. FEMA. And FEMA, yeah. Yeah. So it's a long process. It's a long process, yeah. Um, along with keeping Missoula streets uh, clear from stormwater flooding, um, the other part of it is that you'll see, you guys go out and, um, you have leaves at your house, you pile them up, put them out on the street. Brian does a great job. His guys come around and clean, and clean them up. But at the same time, after he picks them up, he's got to come out there and street, uh, clean the streets. So that way, whatever leftover uh, leaves in that are left, it doesn't plug up the sump. And it doesn't, uh, you know, we have additional maintenance that we have to do. Um, we also, um, part of the, uh, our MS4 permit is that we have to do a lot of public outreach. So we, we try to, um, talk to kids, do uh, presentations. We did the fair last year, but we have to do so many hours of uh, public outreach and, and try to educate the community. We also have to do it internally to the employees. We have to give them training every year what to look for because with the water department, uh, flushing hydrants, flushing blow-offs or whatever, um, the, the importance of, of what the stormwater system is good for and that. So, and we have to document that and then every year we have to submit that to DEQ to show them that we did do this stuff and this is how many people we, we reached out to. Common pollutants, petroleum, paint, sediment, garbage, detergent, chemicals, antifreeze, 
Um, this is what happens with it, uh, something doesn't drain. Um, the sumps don't drain properly or whatever, you get the flooding in that. And same thing with this. This has got a silt screen from a construction site right next, next to it. Um, that's supposed to be uh, cleaned and maintained primarily by the contractor that put that stuff in, but they don't. So that's the importance also. We got to go out there and do the inspections. Um, and then if we clean it, we'll end up giving them a bill that we had to clean it. So, but we, otherwise what happens is it does create flooding. And then like this time of year, if you have thawing, then all of a sudden freezing, freezing at night, and if that stuff is out in the street too far, then we'll end up with icy roads. Do you consider this, the material that the street department puts on the streets as a pollutant? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as we've discussed it before, and Brian's given us some information on it, um, that's one of the things that we try to look at because also what he puts on the street is sand. Well, the sand ends up in the sumps also, but what we've done is that we've identified all the areas where Brian puts sand and the sumps, and we have it on our GIS system, and that's the top priority for our um, the guys going out there, the street guys with the vac trucks to clean up the sumps and stuff. So. We've, we've thought about that too, that is, is some of the de-icer and stuff. We'll go into that. Yeah. Um, here's the basic sump design. So if you want to know what a sump is, basically this is the basic design. It's um, basically you have the grate on top, the top section's four feet, below is another four feet with a bunch of washable dry, uh, drain rock all the way around it. So that drain rock ends up acting like the filter. So it stops the, the material and that going through and that. And that's what we did. It's important that you go out there and clean these. Right now we're trying to get back on track. We're trying to go to a five year period. We think we can do it in a five year period. But there's gonna be some sumps, like, like I said, with the sand and everything, we gotta do every year. We have to do every year. But if you don't do it, what happens? It doesn't drain. And we, we annexed um, out by the airport this last year, out on the express, expressway and that. There were some sumps out there that didn't work, some inlets and that that didn't work. It flooded the intersection, and basically the guys went out there and cleaned them out, and that's all it was. It just wasn't clean. So there's this kind of structure beneath all of those yeah. storm drains. Holy cow! There's a lo over six thousand of them. Um, yeah. Only six thousand. <laughs> only six thousand. <laughs> and then the other part, there is some inlets out there. You'll see the grates and that the in they're inlets, and so those are the systems that the, they're piped and they're piped to a detention basin. Because like out of the airport area, there's in some other 44 ranch, there's some uh, clay areas, sums don't work. So basically, you gotta put the inlets in, and then that goes to the pipe, and then that pipe runs down, it could go down two, three blocks, four blocks, and then it goes to a detention basin where the water goes into, and it sits in a detention basin to drain down. And are some of them just like below capacity or something? Yeah. Like my neighbors, place was flooding and they had to come with a truck and suck the water out. Yeah, we found some areas that, that uh, really working out this last year. Um, There's another uh, detention basin. There was a tree growing in it and there was a foot and a half of, of dirt and grass in it. It's got a concrete bottom. It just hadn't been cleaned and it needed to be cleaned out. So, and then once that detention basin fills up so much, it discharges to another bottom des uh, detention basin. But that's, that's true, that's what happens, is that's why we end up trying to get around and do maintenance. And, and it's been hard because we really haven't done much maintenance. You know, we really haven't done much, much maintenance until this last year. We really started last May, once we started working through with our rate, our rate structure and uh, having meetings with DEQ <coughs> that they say, you have to do this stuff. So, so then for this crowd who are very engaged citizens, what should they be doing in their neighborhoods to clean themselves? Basically, just watch what you uh, run off. You uh, wash your driveway down or whatever. Use a broom. Try to clean up your material, your lawn clippings. Same thing if you can sweep them up in that instead of that going down. Um, also, um, if you guys see something going on where you look at the sumps and there might be some trash on it or leaves on it or whatever, if, and it's raining or something, if you want to clean it off, that's fine. Clean it off and then give us a call, let us know that you cleaned it off or whatever, we can get out there and clean it up. So, like I said, we can do it constantly, but then it ends up being, depends on who throws the trash out. You know, I've see, for some reason I see people throwing McDonald's bags out and stuff on the side of the road and stuff, but it takes all of us. 
you know we only have so many guys to be able to do everything that we need to do so it is it is a struggle sometimes yes sir I think you said you haven't been doing maintenance until this last year yeah ba basic well basically the utility was basically started formed in 2016 so and then when that um, util when the utility first got started there was only two people in it to turn around and write and work with the consultants to come up with a facility plan for stormwater and also then work with a consultant of what the rates need to be um, in order to do that the initial rate that was set up for stormwater was just the initial rate to get these activities going with the consultants on not only the facility plan, what we need to do, what kind of improvements we need to do, what kind of a system do we have. And that was, um, I think that was finalized in 2000, the end of 2018. And then the, uh, the uh, consultants looked at that with our facility plan and said, okay, in order to do this, this is the type of rate you need, this is how much revenue you need to do to meet the, D, uh, the EPA regulations with the Clean Water Act. So that's why it took so, so long. But, and it was more reactive. We did some maintenance, but it was more reactive. You end up calling and say, I got a flood or whatever, we'd send somebody out. It was never proactive. It was just reacted to emergencies and stuff. So last May, working through the budget process and everything, and working out how we can be efficient with, our, with the employees, um, we ended up turning around and getting a couple of guys, in, additional guys in the uh, street department. And all they do is that they take the vector out and they go out and clean the sump. So it started the end of May, beginning of June last year. And Brian will get into some of their activities and well, how much they did. But it's hard to do. You can't go out and do sump maintenance and cleaning maybe sometime this winter. But normally, <coughs> everything's froze and you got snow on that. So do you keep two guys on the payroll under stormwater to go around and do stormwater maintenance when everything's froze and they can't. So we, you know, we didn't want to do that. But Brian could use them for remove, doing snow removal. So that's what we did. We worked together and, and turned around. So stormwater doesn't pay for the whole thing. Stormwater only pays for part of their time for what they do. Streets takes care of the rest. So it's worked out good this year, really good. Some of the issues, um, samples and that, here's a, Paddy Creek Detention Facility, um, like I said, it needs cleaning. You have to go out there and measure periodically, so it needs cleaning. Um, also, Upper Garrett, um, there's a drainage problem up there. Um, we're in the process is that we have that designed to turn around and, and fix that and have to put some piping in that because it's getting worse every year. Um, but we have to go through um, three different agencies, DEQ, I think DNRC, and there's one other one that we gotta go to be able to do a, get the permits to do that, to put that piping in there at Upper Garrett. Um, also, you see how what happens when, when the, they're on expressway, when the sump's not working, same thing. Um, some of the debris in, in Grant Creek. This is uh, my uh, compliance specialist manager, um, Tracy. This is what's going out into the Paddy Creek sampling. And so we have to sample that water. What is going in there? You know, what, what type of uh, contaminants are in there? So we have to sample that, record the sampling, and then we also submit that to DEQ. This is a picture of a good inlet. This picture of a bad on that, with all the stuff blocking it, and, and it's, there's some material in there. <coughs> Let's talk about Missoula water. As you all know, um, as until three years, this June 21st, 22nd, um, the city has owned the water system. So um, Mountain Water was a private company that owned it before, um, but it was for profit. It was all for profit. Um, what we've done is that since the city took over, um, like I said, it's an enterprise fund. You pay your bill, that money stays in the water department. And with that money, we've been paying all the maintenance. We have, we're on a good track record, um, a steady track record now of the maintenance of all the facilities that we got to do in the way of the wells, the booster pumps, all the PRDs, pressure reducing valves, um, our meters, everything that we're doing and mowing and everything you do. We're, we're, we've got a good, good annual average right now of what we're doing. Um, along with that is that the money we're saving by not paying the corporate office is that money we're doing is, is um, putting infrastructure improvements, we're replacing water mains, um, we're replacing hydrants, we're adding hydrants to areas that don't have hydrants. So we utilize the GIS system in the fire department. They say 
these are the areas that don't have good fire protection and we're putting them in. So we also turned around is that one of the biggest areas that didn't have fire protection as you know is Russell Street. So the water stopped back on Wyoming but there was no fire protection up, up this way. So we ended up turning around and, and working with MDT while it was all tore up and they added a main up there and the hydrants. So that way that whole area also has fire protection. Missoula Water provide drinking water, irrigation, fire protection, and other domestic services to the citizens of Missoula. Household, irrigation, drinking, washing dishes, laundry, cooking, washing cars, showering. The city, street cleaning, park irrigation, fire protection, the hydrants. So this is a, a hard to see, but this is the, assist, the a system map of Missoula Water, all the infrastructure in that, all the tanks in that. Um, this is the update on it. So we have 42 groundwater wells, okay? The water rights for those wells, we can pump 73 million gallons per day. That's how much water rights we have. In the summertime, when it's extremely hot, we normally uh, pump 42 to 43 million gallons a day. So we have a lot of capacity to grow. But along with that capacity, as everybody knows, is our leakage. We d the system does leak. So if we can work, if we can keep reinvesting the money, we can keep um, replacing water mains, that <laughs> we can reduce leakage, that that gives us more capacity for future growth because we're nowhere near being into our, our water rights. Um, we have 23 uh, water storage facilities, um, 10.4 million gallons of total storage. Um, we have 46 <laughs> pressure zones. So because of our hills and everything, so when the water's at the top and coming down, you have to break that pressure because more the water comes down in elevation, the pressure goes up. So you have to break it, otherwise it won't be able to be used in your house. You'll be blowing faucets and toilets up. Um, 20, 22 booster stations, 336 miles of water main. Um, 23,000 uh, service connections. We have 1,567 hydrants. Um, approximately 73,000 customers. Um, our average, for, compared to the surrounding areas per capita per day, um, we're not quite the lowest, but it's 140, where Bozeman's 113. Um, but um, everybody else, and I don't know why everybody else is, is higher, but they are. They use a lot more water, so. In, in that map, do you know those residents that are not on city water in the community, how many is that? I don't know. <coughs> it's, um, I think they're all on city water. No. Well, no. There's some. There's some households, um, and I think I know of about 12 that are in the city limits that have that have wells. Um, there's a handful in Linda Vista. There's a couple on the north side, um, but out in the county, it's a it's a mismatch. Um, basically, everybody in East Missoula is on on Missoula water. They're not in city limits. Um, also, out off a third tower and that. There's some of those subdivisions that went in. There's city water out there, but hit and miss in between, like Karis Nursery and that. They're they're all on their own well. So, can you go back to the map, please? Uh, one, sure. one of the interesting things is we, if you look at the map, we serve a much larger area than city limits. So, so we serve Missoula Water serves areas outside of the city limits, yeah. and that's why you, that you see that red boundary. That's actually our utility service boundary. So places like East Missoula or Target Range are on city water even though they're not in the city. Yeah. How much water do you estimate is lost? Basically what they end up doing is we do a, a, a thing every year, couple, sometimes twice a year, is we do a, a tank fall study. Shut everything off from midnight to five in the morning. We, we calculate how much uh, water is dropping on every tank. Um, we turn around and do that, but what the unknown we don't know is that we have to use a national average of what um, a residence or commercial is using. We don't have exact numbers, so we got to use the AWW na national average. Right now, it's showing about 45% leakage. Yeah. Didn't did you just repair lines up in Rattlesnake? Or yep. Yeah, that saved quite a bit. Yes, we ended up, um, and I'll get to that here in a minute. 
we ended up doing, this is the benefit of replacing the mains. We have some, um, unfortunately we have some mains that were put in in 1914, <laughs> 1910. They're good mains, they're, but, the, but the, what happens is that how they're put together, they leak. And with our um, ground soils and everything the way it is, um, I know of leaks that we've had on Broadway, on 12 inch mains, never knew it was, there, no, can't even tell there's a leak there. The only way we knew is that the leak was spraying on a customer service line. And that customer called up and thought they had a leaky service line. So we went out there because you could hear it in the basement, it, it, it echoes. So we, we said, yeah, got a leak. So we did some investigating and did the test from the curb box into the house, it was fine. And we ended up hydrovacking to get to the corp to shut the service line off to see if that's where it was. And when we hydrovac, it was right next to a hub and it was spraying and over 360 gallons a minute. But I got pictures of it. You look at the street, no water surfacing, nothing. The soils will take it. I have a question. Okay. Um, what's the benefit of the city having the, the water, owning the water system versus the company? And was it expensive for, for, for the city to assume that responsibility, like startup money? <laughs> the, the, the second part of it is that that's up to everybody in this room, in this community, whether it was expensive, whether it was a benefit or not. Me personally, I worked around water since 92. So seeing how it was operated in, since 92 to where the city's owning it, it's beneficial for the community to the city own it. You get to help make the decision on rates. If you have a question, you come here or whatever. Well, under private ownership, who makes the decision on rates is the Public Service Commission. Along with the way the rules are set up with the Public Service Commission, they're allowed to make up to 10% return on their investment. We don't make, we don't make a return on our investment. We, we, we put all the money right back into the system. If you have a question about instead of contacting Public Service Commission, you contact the council or you come to the council meeting. Everything stays here. Everything stays here. Me personally, I think it's done up just because I work here, um, but I've seen both sides. I've seen how it was operated and how decisions were made to cut costs. Not only cutting the cost for maintenance on the system, but the cutting costs to affect the health of the employees, um, just for profit. So. One more time. Yep. So, back to the question about what looks like 45% loss from the water system. What does that translate to in terms of cost? You know, eventually going back into the aquifer, right? Yep. So there are costs associated with treatment, storage, pumping, all of that, do you have any numbers? Out? Basically, the way it was designed, even under Mount Water, we looked at it. Um, under Mount Water, it's not feasible to fix a leak that's under 55 gallons a minute. They figured it's cheaper just to pay the pumping cost to, pay it, to pump it. But the problem we have is that Northwest Energy is under the Public Service Commission, the rates and stuff. They're going to keep going for rate increases. They are. They're going to keep all the improvements they, gotta, they do, they're going to keep going. So our power costs right now, just for Missoula water is right now is about 1.4 million gallons a year, or 1.4 million dollars a year. That's our power cost. So um, I think whatever we can do to figure it out where they are, and I'll get into additional stuff that some of the technology we're using to try to find out more leaks. Um, oh, sorry. So this is a picture of our pumping, the hog and wells up the uh, bottom part of Linda Vista. This is the inside of our, our uh, pumping facility. Um, along with the Benton well, this is a couple of chlorine vats because we do add chlorine for disinfection. And then um, this is uh, one of the technicians, the East Missoula tank, uh, replacing the antenna and working on the SCADA system and uh, uh, to be able to operate and make sure everything's communicating from East Missoula to here. Um, back, same thing, 42 wells, 12 tanks, 22 boosters, 53 PRVs, SOBs, and MOVs. PRVs, pressure reducing valves, SOBs, solenoid operated valves, and the MOVs are motor operated valves. So, yes? We don't put fluoride in the water. No, do we? no we don't. Okay. Mm -mm. Do we only add chlorine? Only chlorine, that's it, nothing else. Uh, a couple more pictures. Um, this is our Southwest uh, pump pump house. 
Um, as you can see, all the piping is nice, neat, clean, and painted. Uh, under Mount Water, what they did is that they, instead of painting in that, what they decided to do is take a, um, and uh, it was like a stainless steel insulation to wrap it. And all they were do, all you do is just covering up all the rust. And what happens is that moisture still gets in there and it's still rust. So we have really been trying to upgrade in that. The more we, the more you can maintain and keep keep clean, the longer the stuff is going to last. If you start um, not doing maintenance in that, it's going to wear out faster. Um, self reservoir uh, generator. We have um, we have enough generators. Is that if this town for some reason the whole town lost power with our wells and the amount of generators we have, and plus we have um, we normally store about 85,000 gallons of diesel fuel that we could run the system average day demand for 30 to 45 days. So when we had the power outage, those poles up in Linda Vista um, and all the power was out for, I think it was a week or week and a half or whatever, we never lost any, nobody was ever out of water. We were able to keep everything up in water and that. The only problem there was is that some of the houses that had step systems, the sewer step systems, the little pumps in the, in the basement, they didn't have power for those couldn't discharge any waste. So you had to hook it up to their own generator. Um, Dickens Well, um, this is the picture of the guys removing all the infrastructure of that Dickens Well on the north side. That well hadn't been used for years. And that was the one that was identified in the plume for White Pine Sash. But Mountain Water didn't want to pay the money to go ahead and abandon it. They figured just leave it there. So um, that was one of the things we cleaned up. We took some of the parts and pieces off of that and put it to Willowwood Well. The last few years, Mount Water owned the system. This well was only producing half of what it was supposed to. And what it ended up doing is that the uh, lower part of um, Garrett, Briggs area and that, it reduced the fire flow a little bit. You see more pressure fluctuations. So what we ended up doing is taking some of the parts and pieces out of there, and we bought a brand new pump and put it in here to put that back up to um, full capacity. Um, same thing here, the guys out on uh, 26th Street well, um, they're pulling the pump. So one of the preventive maintenance that we're doing is that we have it on schedule to pull some of our wells. When we start seeing the production change a little bit, we pull it, rebuild the pump, redo the motor. Um, we're trying to put um, energy efficient motors back in if we have to buy a new one. We're also putting VFDs, variable feed drives. So it's a slow start. Um, it's more energy efficient. Along with that, we take in that um, we turn around a camera and scrub the casing pipe. So, and make sure all the perforation holes in the casing pipe are clean and free. So basically what you do that, the, the well and the pump doesn't have to work as hard because the water can flow in there easily. So, and then also the programming work. All of my guys inside, all my production guys, I've got a couple of guys that do all of our programming. They install all of our SCADA system. And after this, we'll split the group in two um, I'll take you guys in two different groups to the, our dispatch area and I'll show you our SCADA system. So it's all computerized, everything. Every time all of a sudden Brian gets a new guy and he's up the rattlesnake and he's filling up the water truck to clean the streets and he operates the hydrant too fast, we see it. <laughs> we see it. We don't do that. Yeah. No, you guys are a lot, lot better. A lot better. So, but it's a really sophisticated system. Um, Valve turning, we try to turn the valves as part of the routine maintenance. The nice thing about doing that is that we make sure they work in case of emergency. Along with is that we do get debris built up in the valve boxes and that sometimes, so we clean them out. Um, there's a couple of um, picture of uh, some taps being on an existing main. Um, this was ended up being on Blackthorn, Blackthorn main leak. Um, that's a PVC main, so you think, okay, it's going to last for 50, 60 years. PVC shouldn't have any problem. But unfortunately, when that was put in, there was an air release. There was a high spot in it, so you got to get rid of the air. So they put an air release in, but they didn't wrap the air release in the saddle with, with plastic and protect it. So what ended up doing the soils, because being a little bit of hot soils up there, it ate through the saddle going around the pipe, and it popped off, and that's what happened. Ended up creating a leak. Same thing, some more pictures of the guys. We had these guys working on main leaks. Um, Grand Avenue tap. Um, this is the South Avenue leak that popped up in the middle of the night, um, along with um, Linda Vista taps. 
and multiple Grand Avenue and Keith Main Lake. So um, these guys are, uh, um, they make my job easy, plain and simple. Uh -huh. um, basically these guys, the distribution guys, um, we usually have two guys on call seven days a week, every day of the year. Um, but these guys take the rotation in it, but if they're not on call and they turn, we get a leak, all I end up doing is texting these guys and they, they start answering, yep, I'm available, they came in. But that's how dedicated they are to make sure that they're available to take care of the system if we have an emergency. 220 recorded leak repairs. So you can see this is the oldest part of the system north of the river. So this is basically north of the river. So you can see where all the leak repairs end up the rattlesnake in that. Um, also out in East Missoula, we've had some others out there. Um, basically what some of these things are is that they, uh, the saddles on the mains, the mains are okay, but because of the soil conditions that clay in that, it ended up eating um, some of the saddles off. So we ended up having to work on that. So. One of the things that we're doing this year is that we have these uh, um, recording devices for decibel levels. So the guys, we do hydrant inspections twice a year. Um, basically what that helps is that with the hydrant inspections twice a year, along with our flow testing and that, it really helps our ISO rating, the city's ISO rating for your insurance, for homeowner's insurance. Um, so what they're doing is that we put, uh, got these at the end of last year and they're going around and they're, they're recording and listening to every hydrant in the system, recording the decibel levels. If the levels are up high, it changes the dots and everything. So this way, we can turn around, take that information, and say, well, wait a minute. Look at all this noise over here on 3rd Street and that. We get a lot of noise. Then the guys can go out there, and we have a computer that we can hook up from valve to valve, and that computer sends the sound down the pipe and indicates where a leak is, pinpoints where a leak is. So it could be a customer service line or multiple service lines, or it could be an actual hole in the pipe. So this is what, because of the soil conditions, we don't see them surfacing. Um, this is part of the effort that we're doing this year. Like I said, they started at the end of last year, and um, we'll do this every time they go to the hydrants, we'll do this, and we'll turn around and check. Some of these, like this one here, um, they recorded it. It's high, it's at the top of Hillview, but it's right outside our pump house. So the pump is running. So that's why the noise level was tough. Because these hydrants, I don't know if you know this, these hydrants are hollow. There's no water in them. So they're a great microphone. It really picks up noise of what's going on in this system and stuff. So, um, Service department, um, they do service line leak investigations, meter change, install new meters, turn curb boxes on and off. You call up and say, hey, I'm going to do some plumbing work. I need my curb box off. Or I got a plumber coming over. I need the curb box shut off. We end up going out. These guys go out there and turn them on and off. Um, we also do consumption investigations, lock offs. If people don't pay their bill, we got to lock them off. Um, you know, they do uh, 24,000 water services. So um, this is uh, one of the technicians digging up a curb box. Not every one of them are accessible, but we'll go out there if we have to do something. We'll go out there and dig it up. Sometimes if it's deep enough, we'll put an extension on it. A couple of guys changing out uh, a two-inch meter. Um, what is consumption investigation? Basically, you call up and say, "There's no way I use that." <coughs> all, all of a sudden, you you know, you have a landscaper that that mows your yard and sets your sprinkler timer or whatever, and they turned it up so high, but you call up and get your water bill and say, "There's no way I use that." There's no way. They'll go out there and turn around and try to help you find out what it is. Now the meters, yes, sir. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt your. Oh. Okay. But the meters, what the meters have is the meter keeps track of your consumption. So they'll keep track of it so they can download, especially the new ones that we've started last year, the meters and that, we da we, it'll keep track of your consumption. Um, I think it's up to six months they can go back. So we've had customers call up in October and say, there's no way I used that much water in July. Well, you're just calling now and they say, yeah, there's no way I did. And so but they can go back and check the meter. And we found some pl uh, places that they leave their hose on. We had one customer that went away that was a snowbird and just after they left, mm -hmm. the uh, hose on the um, supply line on the toilet broke. Mm -hmm. So they contacted us and said, is there any way you can tell us how much water? They would do better than that. So we sent a technician out, downloaded the information, and gave him the date and time when it did. He gave it to the insurance company to outpay. Mm -hmm. So this is the benefit of some of the stuff that the meters met. Yes, sir. 
you may have said this tonight, and I missed it. Um, apart from those 42 wells, are you still drawing water from any of the rivers or creeks at all? Nothing at all. Nope. We stopped in 82. Uh -huh. The Rattlesnake Creek stopped in 82 when, it, when the GRD outbreak happened. Uh -huh. um, but they kept that part of the system online if for some reason we ever needed it for an emergency. Some major emergency happened, we had to put the uh, creek water in, we could. We would have to issue a boil order, we'd have to do a lot. So, but we've never, no, we're only, every, we're 100% groundwater. And basically the way the system works is just remember is that we have these 42 wells and it's all operated by the computer in that. Um, depends on what the system demand is, the area in that. If it's requiring uh, 5,000 gallons a minute because everybody's using water or whatever, but our pumping is 6,000 gallons, 6, gallons a minute, that additional 1,000 will be going into the tank. So it works off the system demand and every, all the excess goes to our tanks. So when the tank levels get up so high, it starts shutting the, the wells off. Yeah. Is there a reason why we don't just like reuse the water instead of putting it back into the river? Um, very expensive. The, the stuff you have to do if you end up doing a water treatment plant like Bozeman does, Bozeman only uses surface water, um, it's very expensive. Um, we do use some of the, the effluent water from the plant, and I'll get into that on the wastewater part. We use about a million and a half gallons a day of the effluent water. Water me uh, meter replacement project. This is one we started last year when we took over from Mountain Water. Um, unfortunately, the meters that Mountain Water was using, we just found out um, that there was an issue with the meters. There was an issue with the registers, the firmware on the registers. When the city took over, we kept on telling them, there's still an issue, there's still an issue. Basically what it was doing, the way the firmware was, was draining the batteries and the meters quickly. They're supposed to last 10 to 15 years, they were lasting 4 to 5 years. So it was really increasing the cost of replacing. So we, the guys went together and they did research, got um, multiple different meter manufacturers that and picked Neptune meters to replace all the meters. Um, so there's a lot of benefits with this project. Um, we're going to end up, after we get everything set up here, um, that we're going to have a customer portal coming in 2021. So basically part of the customer portal is that you can set up parameters. We don't see it. You have your own sign on to the system, the customer portal. You set up your own parameters. You can turn around and say, I'm going to be gone for a week. You're in the middle of summertime, I'm going to be gone. There should be no water use. It ends up happening. If all of a sudden something breaks or water gets used, it'll text you. It'll email you at the water. Bozeman's using it now, so, and it's really great. There's uh, uh, John Alston down there. Uh, we were at a conference together, and he goes, look, and he showed me on his phone. He goes, I use 760 gallons of water today. And I'm going, okay, so he, that's the type of information you have. So you can see if all of a sudden you start using, also it helps you with your budget uh, billing that you can turn around and say, wait a minute, my water's getting a little bit too high, you can, you can start cutting back a little bit if you only have, you know, wor worried about your own personal budget. Yeah. So I just got a love note from some insurance company this week and it's, they used the term Missoula water in there and they talked about uh, the service line which I, I don't know if it's from the main to my house or the curb box to my house. Either way, that they insure in the event that that deteriorates. So my house was built in 62. Mm -hmm. so, and I don't know if it's ever been changed. I have no idea. We might have that information. What that is is that we have, we, we, last year we put it through council that we have a loan program. So if you want a loan program that we will loan you the money, you turn around and replace your service line, or repair your service line, we'll loan you the money to get it done. And then that loan, your monthly payment gets put on your water bill. So the other option is, is that there's an insurance company and uh, um, Montana League of Cities endorses it. They think it's great that it's working out. Some other cities are using it. Is this insurance, is this warranty company? Um, basically, they've asked us if we would endorse it, we do endorse it. Basically, it gives you an op option that you can pay, and I don't know what the dollar amount is like. 60 a year, I think. Yeah, it's like $60 a year. So you got to look at it as whether. I've got customers calling that they want that. Um, they'd rather pay you 60 a year. Currently, right now, depends on how your service line is. I've heard prices ever from $6,000 to $10,000 to replace the service line. So some people rather just turn around and pay the insurance. Other people were like, no, I'd rather just do the loan program. 
Yes. Um, so talking about replacing service lines and also the main repair, um, with the improvements in trenchless technology, is there any hope that replacing those kinds of things are going to be cheaper and easier to do anytime soon? Yes, we're looking at that too. We ended up doing some trenchless stuff. We ended up doing some pipe bursting. We did some pipelining. The pipelining didn't work so well. You know, they had too many issues. Um, the pipe bursting, um, unfortunately what happened with the pipe bursting is that there was no structural integrity left in the old pipe. So basically putting the, the, the yeah. boring tool and everything through the pipe, it took the old main and just collapsed it like a beer can. And so they had to dig up and they ended up being, we did it over on Mary Avenue and that, we ended end up having to dig up like every 30 feet, cut that section out and try it again. But we are, I have guys that go to the uh, annual conference um, national conference, AWWA, um, try to send them in June to do that, and they're looking at that technology because I don't want to keep tearing up Bryan streets. You know, it is. And it is, it, there is some companies locally, well, that'll bore. So they'll bore a new service line in, but it's still expensive. I've heard anywhere from 50 to $70 a foot. <coughs> yeah. Water system improvements last year. Um, this top one, South Avenue East, we replaced 1,431 feet of pipe. That was a collaborated effort with Street Department. Basically, we ended up going out there and uh, we needed to replace the main. It was leaking pretty bad. We ended up replacing the main. Um, the contractor gave us a price to fill that, to repave the trench. Um, we looked at the savings to do that. Brian could pave the whole street for that same dollar amount. So Brian turned around and fixed all the ADA ramps, made sure we were in compliance. We made sure we had all our hydrants at when we did the a main replacement, and then we ended up pay, uh, repaving the whole street. So we, we got a better better job, more more work, you know, more better road, everything for the same dollar amount. Actually less, because if you look at it, we budgeted. Oh look at this hazard. Yeah. We budgeted seven hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars, but the prices we got in were five hundred and fifteen thousand three hundred ninety six, a cost difference savings of two hundred and fifty four thousand dollars. One of the reasons is is that what we've learned is that we're really working on designing and planning all, all of our projects in fall and winter and we're putting our jobs out in, in like January, February, March, before the contractors get busy. When the city took over at the end of June, um, in 2017, we couldn't do any com um, capital projects main replacement. The contractors were busy, but they said, yeah, we'll do it, almost twice the price. So we took, the, took a step back, did a bunch of the maintenance on our wells and everything, and then worked on this stuff. So um, Spruce Street, um, this one here, 643 feet of pipe. Wyoming Street, 655, Grant and Harve, 1830. So a total of 6,403 feet. Um, basically a savings of doing everything. We did have some stuff go over it because the unknowns on the PRB um, and also on Wyoming Street. The Wyoming Street we partnered with um, MRA because they needed to do some additional work on and widen the street and everything so we partnered that. Um, but basically we ended up by doing what we did and our pricing and everything work with the contractors $892,000 savings. I take that $892,000 and replace more mains. So the effort of that, by doing this, um, north side water leakage reduced. We had a 61% leakage on the north of the river. Basically, we reduced it down to 41%. We replaced 14,769 linear feet of leaking water main, 8,500 linear feet of 105-year-old main, 220 uh, in 2020 water main replacement projects, Warden and Howell, East Pine to Spruce, West Pine Riverfront Triangle. Savings, 930,000 gallons of water per day by do that, just north of the river. That's what we saved. So, and none of it was surface. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> yeah. We'll get real quick wastewater. I'm going to be getting into Brian's time. Sorry, Brian. Take your time. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, basically, the wastewater department is uh, four really separated four collection, treatment, pre treatment, laboratory, and composting. As you can see here, this is the wastewater plant. Over here is the um, compost facility. Collections, uh, collections department is responsible for cleaning and maintaining 377 miles of wastewater lines 
using equipment such as high pressure jet trucks. Uh, they tell uh, they camera the systems also to see if there's any breaks in the in the in the pipe or if there's any roots or other stuff poking th into the, the sewer system. Uh, maintaining 31 lift stations and approximately 1,700 step systems. Step system basically on some of the houses depends on where they're located are. Basically, it goes into the step system. The step system tank has a pump in it, and that pumps out into the system. It's not gravity. So there's a little box on the outside of the house, and there's a little red alarm on here. So if something happens and it's got floats in here that it <coughs> fills up, that alarm will go off. Or if the pump stops working, fills up, the alarm will go off. You see that alarm? You call that number on the box, and our collection department goes out there and takes care of it, even if it's in the middle of the night. The step system only pumps liquid stuff. Yes. Yep. And then the guys will go out here and suck out the solids periodically. Thanks. Do you uh, get them on a list for that, for the pumping out the solids? Because I bought a house two years ago, and the alarm went off, and they came yeah. out, and it was great. They just changed. Yeah. It should be a normal routine for the collection part, but you can call the, the plant, talk to Pat Brooks, and see where you are on the list, how often they'll be doing it. They usually try to keep track of it. Um, there's some houses they got to do every year. There's other houses there's not that many people living in it. You only have to do it twice or, or every two years or three years. Oh, okay. So, yep. Uh, treatment plant, um, it, an advanced secondary treatment facility with biological nutrient removal and ultraviolet disinfection. Beneficial reuse. We're using uh, treated effluent to irrigate about approximately 85,000 poplar trees. So a million and a half gallons of the effluent a day we're pumping out to and, and watering those trees. So that way that water doesn't have, the effluent doesn't have to go into the Clark Park River. Poplar trees grow quick really quick and they're a really good source for sucking up the nutrients. They really take all that water that we put on it really good. Dennis, can I ask where the trees are? Are they up there by the treatment plant? Yep. Yeah, they're... Um, this is all of them back here. Okay. Yep. Is that their sole purpose? No, actually when it was first set up it was to turn around <coughs> and uh, possibly be able to sell the trees to some type of market. Um, we're also looking at it right now. It's actually with the compost facility and that um, the compost facility would can use them also because they need the wood products to be able to make uh, compost. Um, this is a code gen. Um, this was installed a few years ago. I think it was three years ago, two years ago. Um, basically, as you know, uh, wastewater treatment plant um, with the methane gas. There's gas from uh, that off takes off the from the treatment plant. So instead of putting it in the atmosphere, um, we could use that gas, and it's a generator. So we fuel that generator to offset the power bills for the the wastewater plant. So instead of putting it in the atmosphere, it takes care of it there, and we turn around and generate some power. Uh, so some some of the system improvements we did Owen Street lab expansion, re-roofed over there, Mount Sentinel communication station. This up here is that we used to have a little tiny building up there that we rented. Um, we ended up putting our own building for all the, all the utilities and also emergency services to put their equipment antennas on up there. And um, so that way it's all contained in one lockable building. LED light upgrade, uh, we replaced the lights at the plant. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, but the plant's got to be manned 24 hours a day. It, um, you know, the lights are on at night. So we're looking at all the lights like here. We replaced here last summer. We replaced all our lights with LED lights. Whatever we can do to save power it is better off, much better for the system. Uh, trouble screen, centrifuge rehabilitation, Garden City compost, Missoula citizens, commercial tree trimmers, landscapers bring all the yard waste and that to there. Seven dollars a pickup load. Um, anybody can bring it in. Seven bucks a load. Um, it includes tree trimmings, brush, grass clippings, leaves, other organic material. So basically this is the Christmas trees that were all dropped off and they're running it through the grinder so they can turn around take that material, mix it with the biosolids and that to make compost. Will they anytime soon be offering a collection service? We're looking at it. There is some companies out there that do it now if you want, and also a delivery service. There's some landscapers that will deliver. If you want compost, they'll deliver for you. They also offer to turn around if you want to pick it up. So that could be coming in the future. I don't know when.
there is a composting service to your house for compost. They pick up every week. Yeah. <laughs> basically, the biosolids production mixing. So basically, the plant discharges the biosolids. We take a bunch of the wood products and everything, and it mixes it all together and, and discharges it. Basically, the aeration bunkers, what we do is we take all that material and, and then pile it up. In order for good compost to be made, it has to reach a certain temperature. Once it reaches a certain temperature, and then you have to keep it there for a certain period to be able to have a Class A compost, basically, basically that kills everything in the compost, any, any bugs or anything that in it. And basically what they do is that this is the big blowing air. Um, these, have, these tubes have air, uh, holes in them. And what we do is we regulate the air going through there to maintain that temperature. Because if we just let it go and not put air in it, it gets really hard, it could be combustible to start a fire. So that's what they do. They go through there, it sits over there for so many days, and then they stockpile it for sale. Question. Yes. Well, we know there's lots of things that go into, <coughs> excuse me, into the biosolids that um, don't get broken down in compost, such as pharmaceuticals and such. Is there ever a plan to create some compost that does not include biosolids for garden use? Not, not yet. No. No. But there is some other companies out there. There's other people that do that. They're promoting that. Um, they say <coughs> cow manure, horse manure, and everything. They're, that's what they're making it out. But the same thing. You give horses shots, you give cows shots, and stuff like that. It's all in there. But they'll turn around and call that organic. But they won't call this organic. So we do test it. We do test the compost and that to make sure it's, it's good stuff. And that it might be in the pamphlet too. And also this uh, Jason um, Duffin out there, the manager out there, is a wealth of knowledge. Can show you all the testing they do to see what's in the compost. This is an article that was done uh, beginning of this year. Um, National Geographic did an article on the compost facility. So excellent article. Um, really shows you can really see the poplar trees out there. Um, Gene, I laugh at Gene because he went up on the one uh, roof out there to take pictures of the poplar trees, wanted to take a picture like this. They've grown so much you can't see over the trees anymore. It just, it, it's, cause it, you know, it, they've grown very, very fast. Um, the poplar tree project started in 2014. The city wanted to keep excess phosphorus and nitrogen out of the Clark Fork River. Planted approximately 85,000 trees. Irrigated with a facility treated effluent. Trees will be harvested after about a 12 year period. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna modify that a little bit by turning around and cutting some of them out to offset for the, um, the compost facility. We're also working with Park and Rec. Um, they buy all their trees. So we're gonna look at what work with Park and Rec and try to um, plant our own because that way it could be used throughout citywide. So. Um, I just want to comment. I was up on Waterworks Hill not too long ago, and we were totally staring at that, and we were like, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how long, I, how long years on, you know, Waterworks, and just all of a sudden I noticed it. So how long has it been there? <laughs> Since 2014. Okay, but then, and then, like, they've right. grown all of a sudden? <laughs> 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 so the video won't play? <laughs> No. <laughs> so I was going to show a little video, but it's not working correctly. So basically, it's an aerial view of all those trees out there, along with the compost facility and everything. One of the things that we're working on real quick is also with the um, City County Health Department, Water Quality District. Um, out here, just north of here, is that um, they're looking at, they need a place for hazardous waste. We do a temporary site. We help them out and they do a temporary site. We're looking at um, working with them, build a building just north of the compost facility that'll be a permanent hazardous waste facility. So that way if you have stuff, they're planning on only having it open a couple of days a week, but it'll be a permanent place to have. So um, whatever we can do, so have, make it easier for customers to drop that stuff off, that better off for us because then that stuff's not going into the drains or down on the ground back down into the office. That's the, that's the has waste collection that you yeah. do once a year where you can go drop the stuff off and yeah. then it'll be available now year round when we get that facility. Yeah. 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 Do I understand correctly that the land that the trees are on is all privately land that's been leased and it's mostly floodplain? Yep. 
Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's a lease process right now. We lease it um, with the um, the property owners out there. Um, they said we have first right of refusal if they ever decide to sell. Um, but it is. It's all floodplain all the way up to um, actually all the way up to here. There's a there's a bench there where the couple of houses are. It's identified all the way up to that bench that all that down is all floodplain. Yes. Years ago, there was this discussion about this huge plume of fuel that's sitting on top of the aquifer over in the switch yards at the road. What's what's the status of that? I haven't heard anything on that. No update, nothing on that. I, I guess I recall it was hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel sitting yeah. out there. I haven't heard anything on that. We test all our water right at the wells, and it doesn't show up on any all our wells in that. But um, that's a good point. You know, I'll check with our utility engineer and see if he's heard anything on it. But never been notified afterwards. Thank you, Dennis. Sorry it took so long, guys. Yeah. Get Brian going. Get me going. Well, I won't everybody stand up. I'm going to. We got to get mine set up here. So I'll uh, just take a minute before I get started to introduce myself. Brian Hensel, Deputy Public Works Director for Street. I was born and raised in Missoula since 1969. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I went to Coltsburg, Meadow Hill, Sentinel High School. So uh, I actually talked to a teacher today from Meadow Hill who was there when I was in grade school. Very nice lady. <laughs> All right, um, which button do I push down? That one there. All right, thank you. All right, so Streets Division. This is still kind of new to me, but about two years ago, we put together Street Maintenance Traffic Services, Comp Shop, Siding Striping, all in the one department under Public Works. So I will try to do my best to give the other two departments as much credit as I do the street maintenance. I was the street superintendent for 18 years. Mr. Painter was a fire chief when I was a superintendent, so he's laughing. <laughs> so anyway, you can see here, uh, we all answer to Jeremy. He's our big boss. And then, uh, then they decided to put me as deputy director. I don't think anyone else wanted the job, primarily because of traffic services. So as you can see, uh, we flow down to our supervisors, and we have one admin. And so I have some very competent people here. I may refer to their names, so I'll just give you briefly. Street Supers are now Rocky Teeters, Kevin O'Brien, Traffic Services Sign Shop, Chad Pancake. And that is his real last name. <laughs> and then Rick Larson in, in uh, Signal Comp Shop. And then I'm working on a new admin, so I actually can't say her name. So, All right, moving on here. Uh, I'm going to go kind of quick here. I could probably spend an hour on every one of my subjects with what we do. Everything we do at, at streets this season, and I probably talked to a number of you folks at different seasons. So I wanted to put this map up here. This is our work zone, the whole city. And in the middle of the red here, these are MDT state routes. How many of you know that MDT has highways basically going through town? Great, perfect. So some of our public outreach is working. So we get calls on MDT routes. Some of the things I can help with, some of the things I can't. One thing a lot of folks don't know is that the City of Missoula and Public Works and Parks, Traffic Services, we have a maintenance contract with MDT. So what we do is they pay us to maintain their routes. We plow, we sweep, we patch potholes, we do snow operations, whatever needs to be done. So I wanted to show this. And the reason I show this is this takes up a lot of our time in streets. Okay? Next one. Uh, just some quick statistics. 337 centerline miles, that does include the state routes. Uh, the DOT is 30.2 of that, so the city is whatever's left, like 304. Uh, area within the city limits. I had I pulled this up just because this is a really cool stat. I like this. 29 square miles of what we take care of, and then last year it was bumped up a little bit. Some of you may have benefited from that. Don't throw anything at me. Because we increased, we took in the annex area out by the airport. Missoula population. So I remember, like in 1972-73, when I could understand what my parents were saying. What was it, 15,000 people, plus or minus? Who's been here this long? <laughs> Am I close, 15, then the 30,000? I don't remember, I just... <laughs> 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 no, I think you're right, I think I remember being a lot less. Yeah, like yeah. 40 and it's just grown up. And so now, I think, yeah, in 18, 74,000. We might even get closer to 80 by now. If you live up Miller Creek, it's probably over 80. 
Everybody wants to move up there. All right, so uh, back to our maintenance agreement. So the t it's a two-year agreement. We negotiate every year. We usually try to get a little bump on them. Uh, right now, we are still negotiating for FY20 20 and 21, so we're still under the interim 1819 contract. Uh, and, and part of it, MDT reimburses us for labor and any materials that we would do while maintaining the routes. And as of FY19, we're at half a mil. Okay. Uh, one other cool thing with this contract is that it allows the city to do special projects which are projects that would go above normal maintenance. Like for example, last year, Stevens Ave, we tip sealed that. Okay, that was a special project. What's great about those is you get a, basically a brand new street and also the city is allowed to generate revenue on it because the city or MDT reimburses us for labor and equipment costs they pay for the materials, okay? Oh, one other thing too, City of Missoula is one of the few municipalities that actually still has an MDT contract and I take some pride in that. They enjoy working with us. We save them a bunch of money, benefits the community. Uh, some of the, the things that all three of our departments do, obviously streets, we do the snow ops, street cleaning, storm sewer, pothole patching. I know there's never enough of that. One thing I will say about MDT, they're really good about investing in maintenance in their routes. A lot of the state routes don't require a lot of pothole patching, usually. Traffic signal comm shop, they do the traffic signal repair and maintenance. They work with MDT on the timing and we're working on that. Uh, Jeremy's been very instrumental in looking at what he calls low-hanging fruit and looking at ways if we can get a comprehensive study and maybe improve some of our, our traffic volumes just by adjusting some of the timing. But it's unbelievably complicated. When you look at a signal and you think, oh, I'm waiting here for too long. Well, what you don't realize, there might be four lanes of traffic. One of them's going left, and then you got to count for the bike lanes going across, and then people crossing walking. You just don't go change it. It affects all those different things. We are going to get a new traffic engineer and hope that we can get going on that. So hopefully we'll see an improvement here. Uh, traffic services sign shop, they on, on the state routes, they take care of signs when they get run over, they need to be replaced. Striping, curb painting. Yeah, I don't know if I need to explain that, that's pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to try and go fast here because we don't have a lot of time. Um, traffic signals, here's one of our guys up here in a bucket truck. I have to commend these guys, they're a crew of four people and they get a ton of work done. We have two guys that are on call alternating every week, 365 a year. Middle of the night, snowstorms, you'll see these guys up on a bucket truck fixing a, a traffic signal, okay? One thing, when we have power outages and everybody calls, they can't do anything until the power comes back on. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, um, their budget isn't very big. 323,000, 65,000 in supplies. On a grand scale for a city this big, that's not that much. And then we have four folks. Um, this would be traffic signals. This is uh, Rick Larson, but he's the supervisor in that and he does a great job. So of their MDT contracts, 58 signals, we have 11 that the city owns. We have 470 light poles. That's another thing these guys have to deal with. So all the luminaires, and a lot of them aren't even owned by the city. Some of them are special lighting districts. So when you get a phone call that your light's out, Lori has been in charge of trying to figure out whose poles are whose and who has to pay to fix them. Uh, it's not an easy job. Another thing, uh, Mr. Larson also spends a fair amount of time doing plan review. And that's kind of outside of his normal job description, but what we found is when contractors come in and they do developments that they include traffic lighting, the city has standards on that, is that if he doesn't review them and they don't put them in according to the city standards, when the subdivision's accepted and we take ownership, and if they're not done right, he's got to fix them. So it helps the city, saves you folks taxpayer dollars if Rick can get in right at the onset and get them done right and make the developer pay to do it according to our spec. What's a special lighting district? Somebody want to help me with that, Jeremy? <laughs> I'll let you. Basically, a special improvement district for lighting. So a lot of most of the lights in the city were created by special lighting improvement districts, and uh, Northwestern Energy owns and maintains those lights. We pay an assessment every year to operate them. It's complicated. So I'm just starting to learn that. <laughs> so if I want more street lighting in my neighborhood, what, what do you do? Um, you contact us and we'll figure out what you have and 
and how to go about getting additional lights. But that's something we've been trying to figure out. We're working with Northwestern Energy to, to get a better handle on, on who owns what and, and where we have good light and where we need more. Um, one of the things we've talked a lot about is that the lights are, most of their lights are very old. And so they're not even producing the light that they're intended to do in the beginning. So what's happening right now is they're gonna go through and replace all those lights with new LEDs. They've done a few around town, but that will make a dramatic difference. And then we're gonna to look to fill in those gaps. Where do we also need light to, to provide good safety? When you say who, like who owns what, like who are the possible owners? Like the city or the county? So, or like well, it's, it, it's really three main owners. So the city owns lights, MDT owns lights, and Northwestern Energy owns okay. lights. And, and it's a mix, so. And it's, sometimes it's difficult to figure out who's or who's. And with that, so traffic luminaire lights get run into. Uh, Rick Larson does a great job of following up with these, seeing if we can find out who the person was that ran into them, checking with their insurance company, and hopefully we can get reimbursed. And he does a great job with that. I'd, I'd say he probably, He's more successful at getting us reimbursed when these get run over, and you'd be amazed how often light poles get hit. If we don't get reimbursed, then we have to pay for it. Notice that small number on the budget, the $65,000. Um, Twelve grand for, for one of these. This one was $3,500, $4,000, they didn't even take this one out all the way. So $65,000 doesn't last very long if Rick doesn't go out and try and track down insurance. And he, uh, he wanted me to add all these slides in here. <laughs> he wanted me to emphasize how much time that takes. So uh, just a few more examples. We won't spend too much more time on it. So another thing, uh, a lot of one of their main functions is that he'll go out, maintain, adjust, and monitor our time clock controlled flashing zone lights and RRFBs. That's rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Basically what these are, these are signal infrastructure that allows drivers to become more aware of people crossing the streets. So if you come to an intersection, you need to stop and pay attention, and these help get your attention. Notice this, this one has a solar panel on it. These are great. You don't need power. However, they're expensive. So when these get mowed over, we really need to hopefully find the insurance company of the driver that did it. We had one of these over by Sentinel and somebody stole the solar panel off. <laughs> I think that was two grand just for the solar panel. So, and, and with that, as we get requests from the public all the time, when I would, had to cut, take over traffic services and I had to join the traffic services team, we, we meet weekly. Jeremy's a part of that. We get requests from citizens and they're about, I mean, people are concerned. Everyone wants to get pedestrians where they're going safely. But they're expensive, we have to maintain them. So Jeremy was really instrumental, and Lori too, putting together some qualifications. <coughs> so we go through a process, and we all look at it, we evaluate what's the traffic count, what's the ped count, what's the accident history. And so it isn't just one person saying, no, we'll do it, or yes, we will. It's the group of us, and it's, it's made a tremendous difference. Because we have to balance our time and our resources. Next question, uh, radio communication, traffic, comm shop. They handle all of the communications for all the city vehicles, police, fire, public works, parks. So when this stuff breaks down, they gotta fix it. They put in new radios, they put them in vehicles, they maintain our tower sites. And I wanted to give credit, uh, just, well, what was it, three or four months ago, um, we were made aware of some major issues with police radio coverage, particularly on their handhelds where they'd go to certain places and they couldn't communicate. And so we got a $100,000 emergency allocation. Rick worked with the county, U of M, police department, and upgraded our tower sites. We put in some new equipment in the county courthouse with cooperation with the county. He got it done in two months. And I really wanted to commend him because this was kind of a, we got to get this fixed right now. And it was complicated. I remember when he finally thought he had it all done, and when, when the towers would switch, they, 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 wherever they get the better signal, like there'll be one up on Mount Jumbo, and then they'll switch, and then there was this, this phantom beeping that was happening, that was driving the police department nuts. <laughs> but he figured it out, and I'd always go check on him once, we'd say, Rick, did you get that noise figured out? And he finally got it, so hats off to Rick for getting that done so quick. Oh, can I? 
Yeah, no, go ahead. This, this screen does what I wanted it to do. All right, all right, so <laughs> this is the back of a police car. Okay, so another thing, we do in-house. Rick's guys, any new police cars that come in, they put in the, all the communications, the laptops, the lights, everything. And this is a lot of work. So everyone, well, I'll get to the next slide. But anyway, 238 city vehicles, 259 radio, 30 police patrol cars, and they're getting more. So here's some of the work that's going into it. Um, they put on stripping, installing all the old electric, uh, electronic equipment, 80 hours to do one police car. Now, here's the thing. You see you all seen the Dodge Chargers, right? When those came out, that's a huge learning curve because all the electronics on that were different than from the old Crown Vicks they used to have. Well, now I just heard that police department is switching from the Dodge Chargers to a Ford, I think it's an Expedition, all-wheel drive, high-speed rated. we got to start over. So they had the chargers figured out, starting to get our install times picked up, we're going to have to start over again. But the benefit is those new expeditions are all-wheel drive. Those chargers are real-wheel drive. So the police department's really looking forward to it. Traffic services is not looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> but the benefit of it is that when we do it in-house, um, this is data from last year, but Rick estimated at least $2,400 savings per vehicle, which is huge. Plus, the extra benefit is since our guys install them when things go wrong, we fix them. Okay? They know how to fix it because they put it in. And believe me, these things go wrong. Or some, a policeman will run into somebody or you know, whatever. So, oh, one thing I will mention, Rick did get another tech this year. Um, we had a good budget year and uh, we've got some additional resources. He's not been able to find somebody yet, but we're working on it. So hopefully we can improve our output on getting those police cars out on the street where they should be. All right, next, next one, traffic services sign shop. Mr. Pancake is in charge of this operation. And I have to commend Rick and Chad. I came into this, what, two years ago and was gravely concerned and worried. These guys do a great job. As Dennis said, they make my job so much easier. Okay. The only thing though is now they hit me up for money. When I was the street <laughs> superintendent, I'd say, no, you're not getting anything. Now that we're all one big happy family, they're always saying, hey, Brian, I need you to buy this, or can you give me some new paint? And I was like, yeah, all right. So they're, now they're like stepchildren for me. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all, I can get into it if we had time, but we've seen a, some improvements in cooperation and some, some achieving some efficiencies where we didn't have it before. All right, traffic services, $155,000 material budgets, 460 in personnel, Chad. So Chad supervisor, three full-time, two part-time employees. So small operation, remember my work zone, the whole city. So his crew, they go out and last year they did 158 linear miles of long line striping. What is that? I think that truck's about four or five years old. Chad finally got a modern Striper. I don't know if you guys have been here long enough. They used to run around in a red little Massey Ferguson tractor. That's how they used to do it. So this was a tremendous improvement. They were able to up their production, and it's worked out tremendously for them. Um, several years back, they used to be able to use oil-based paint. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the industry, but um, they switched to water-based. I don't know if it was an EPA thing or OSHA. Um, we had to go to water base because of safety concerns with the employees applying oil-based paint. So what, what that did was safer for the employees, but greatly reduced the longevity of the striping. You used to be able to get three to five years with oil-based, now we get one to two maybe with water-based. So with that, we really struggled to get all this stuff restriped. So uh, we have 68 miles of bike lanes, those should all be restriped annually. We have 350 bicycle share arrows. We get a request for an additional 900 symbols. Huge. We, we don't get them all done. We just don't. Um, waterborne paint, we put down 4,4500 gallons. So what we have to do is we have to triage. Chad has to go out and do the worst of the worst. But one thing I will say, there is a ray of sunshine. Uh, and I'll, I'll skip to the, the curb painting they do too. That's when, as needed, on request, um, you could never get it all done. We don't have enough people. Um, however, I have to commend Chad. He was working with one of his vendors, and they have this new type of, it's a, they call it Premark, 
What it is, it's a polymer, basically heat tape, that the symbols come preformed. You buy them, he lays them out where they need to go. I, I, he hit me up for one of these heaters, too. These were like 1200 bucks. <laughs> they got one when they made the order, and then he wanted another one, so uh, Street bought that for him. But anyway, what these are, propane-powered, they're like a big hair dryer, but you wouldn't want to put it on your head. Mm -hmm. so what they can do, lays these down, run it over with heat, takes about 10, 15 minutes, five to seven year life out of these symbols. Yeah. So the ray of sunshine is, if we keep up with this program, and all indications are, and we have the budget to do it, we might be able to get caught up at some point, at least with the symbols. So we're trying to use these every year and keep adding to it. So now, he doesn't have to come back to this one next year, he can come back to it in five to seven years. <coughs> Signage, um, these guys are out all the time replacing signs, fixing signs. That last windstorm we had about a couple weeks ago, he was doing like that first Monday, 16 signs, he twisted, turned, knocked down, people run them over. Um, stop signs, I think those are what, three or four hundred bucks a piece. Some of these uh, residential street Locate signs like Mary Jane. Can't keep that one. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently college kids like that. I don't know why. <laughs> so these guys go out and they're, they're updating. They're, when the retro reflectivity fades on them, they try to knock out a few of those every year and just keep going. There's probably over 100,000 signs in this town. How many of you knew that they actually lose their reflectivity after so many years? Yeah, you can tell. Yeah, you can tell. <laughs> Another thing. I have to commend these guys too. Reserve Street Median, have you guys all seen that new one? Have you seen the chevrons on either end? Well, what happens in the winter time? Dirty. They get all dirty. So every morning, Chad's guys have been going out at five before the traffic starts, and they're wiping them off. Yeah. So you can see. We're working with MBT to get some additional, either some additional retro or reflectivity on that delineator, and hopefully lights. Okay? Because we've had several complaints on it, I just go click send to MDT on those because that's not part of my maintenance contract, but we do clean the signs off. So hats off to those guys and they were out there every morning. Um, mentioned the 100,000 signs. Uh, Chad also manages uh, the mountain line, all the bus stop signs for them. They go through a lot of the same problems we have. It's only $3,000. We're either going to try and bump that up or maybe get rid of it and make Mount Lion do their own damn signs, but I don't know yet. We'll see. Um, delineators and other reflectors get run over, get fixed. Like those ones on 3rd Street that are 3rd and Russell, Chad has to maintain all those and clean those. And then when those get knocked out, he has to go out and fix those. On ball bouts, you'll see delineators. My snow plows like those on occasion. <laughs> Another thing too, so I mentioned our traffic group. When people call up and say, Brian, I want a stop sign here, or Brian, I want a ped crossing sign here. Well, part of that is we rely on Chad and his, his traffic guys to go out and put traffic counters out. He'll do over 100 traffic speed counts. That'll give us vehicle speeds. It'll give us all kinds of information, like 85th percentile, and that's part of our process. He spends a huge amount of time doing those. So we just don't, if you call me up, and ask for a stop sign, it puts us to work. We have to go through our process. Another thing Chad also does, like Rick, is if you have a developer putting in a subdivision, they almost always have striping for the most part. Chad also spends quite a bit of time reviewing those plans to make sure that they meet our city standards. Same deal if we accept something that Chad never looked at, it may not be the city spec. Once it's done and approved, we own it. And then if it's not right, he'll have to go out and restrike it. They got enough to do. And so what we're doing is trying to be proactive, get this done in advance so it's right. Another big thing uh, with our maintenance contract and also, also the city, Chad's guys will go out and they hand shovel snow. They have a four wheeler, four and a half miles of sidewalks that they take care of and maintain. Monday, they were out at 5 a.m. doing bridges and sidewalks downtown. Big job. They, get, they spend a lot of work for it. I buy the granular de-icer for them. <laughs> but hats off to those guys. They do a tremendous job, and they're on call on weekends every weekend. Well, in the wintertime. Sidewalk grinding. So this is a program Chad started, 
gosh, I forget the year, but I think about three or four years ago. Whereas we bought this grinder, um, I think the machine itself was, I want to say like five or six grand, and then these cutting heads are $2,000 a piece. So what we did down in the downtown area where the majority of pen traffic is, if we have a, a sidewalk that's heaved, he'll go out and grind it, remove this, the trip and fall hazard. That program is saving us around 50 grand a year in trips and falls that we aren't paying for anymore. Our insurance rates have gone down that much. We weren't paying that much in claims, but it dropped our insurance that much. So hats off to that program too. That seems smart. How much do you think he makes a year? <laughs> <laughs> I know how much he makes, but I don't know that he'd be happy if I told everybody. <laughs> it, is, it is public information. I'll leave that to you to look that up. It'll give you an opportunity to see our website. I always encourage folks to go to our website. We put a lot of work into it. So, All right, street maintenance. This is where I spent 18 years of my life. So that's just a quick pick. That's us doing some chip sealing uh, probably two or three years ago. You know, I take new pictures, but they all look the same. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so street division budget. We have substantially more money, but we are also substantially bigger, and everything we do costs a lot more money. But just a couple things. Some of our, our budget comes from gas tax. We've had that since, well, way before my time. Uh, since 1994, we never saw an increase until, what was it, two years ago they bumped it up? And the good thing about gas tax, how many tourists do we get in Missoula? Visitors in the summertime. Three million. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, okay, so gas tax, they're all, every time they fill up their tank, they're contributing to my budget. Okay, so that's a burden that isn't all levied on property taxes. And that's a huge part of what we do. So we can take that money from out of staters and I can put it into your streets. Uh, road district gives me 1.4, personnel 2.7. So here's me. I, sh I should have probably been, I don't know if I should have put me on this one because I was on the first one. But anyway, two superintendents, 33 full-time crew. Street sweeping. So this is one of our, our huge programs. We help protect air quality, water quality, clean the sumps before, well, we try to get the debris off the streets before it gets to the sumps. We'll run four sweepers, one flusher truck, and we flush the material to the side, keep, gets the fines, cleans the street better. And we try to get it four times a year. Uh, last winter was so nasty and so car and carried late, and we normally do a spring cleanup, we didn't even get close to getting done. So what happens is we want to try to do spring cleanup, get all the winter sand and, and all the streets clean before our normal program starts in April. We didn't even come close last year. Um, well, I could tell you war stories from last year's winter all night if you want. But uh, excellent program. Um, we, we just we put a lot of effort into it. And I'll tell you what, street sweeping is probably one of the most appreciated things we do. And we put out flyers. There's information on our website. Um, we try to stay on schedule as best we can. All right, leaf collection. All right, this is my least favorite time of the year. <laughs> so <laughs> leaf collection is probably the most appreciated service that the city does. So you know, last year we did 1,100 loads of leaves, and that's pretty typical. And what we do is we'll send out team, loader teams, and we usually can only do two loader teams with three, two or three tandem axle dump trucks and leaf tarps, and they do all the bulk collection. The loaders go through, work together, push leaves in, throw them into trucks. Several years ago, I bought this garbage truck. It was a surplus out of Deer Lodge. I think I got it for like $27,000. Fixed it up, made it work. That one garbage truck takes the place of about three tandems because it can compact it. All the leaves go over to Garden City Compost, and now when they come out in a big brick, it's really kind of cool. I wish I had a couple more of them. Last year, because of the cooperation and some of the reorg that the city's done, I borrowed on a compost loader, and I borrowed one from the county and I put three loader teams out. This was the first year in my 20 years of leaf collection we were able to complete all bulk collection on schedule. So the loaders, the loaders don't care if it's cold, snowing or not, doesn't matter, they'll pick it all up. We got all that done. The problem is the street sweepers cannot operate when temperatures are below 32 degrees. So 
So what happens is we're usually really good at getting the first two areas done in the first couple weeks or even three weeks of leaf collection. We can bulk collect and sweep, but then the weather hits. And then I gotta stop. It's the same guys that do leaf collection and the same ones that do snow walks. That throws my whole schedule into turmoil. Nothing I can do. And then when we get done with snow, if the temperatures are cold, we can still send the loaders out. So people get confused. You you clean my street with leaves, but there's still some out there. Well, that's probably because it got cold and I didn't get to sweep again. We were able to get the bulk done. We still were not able to, well, we got close on sweeping, but it's it's sporadic. Our schedule's out the window, but we try. And the one thing I get on leaf collection is why do we do it? Why are you wasting taxpayer money on this? So like Dennis said, even if we didn't pick up your leaves from your yards, all the leaves that would fall on the street anyway, I have to pick those up. Because what happens if I don't, if I just leave them all winter? They start to ferment. All the Tweety Birds get drunk if they land in <laughs> And they stink and they're slippery. So those are the places we don't get to. That's how I know that. So we'd have to do it anyway. So years ago, and this program was started long before me, is that the city wanted to try and organize it. Because what people were doing, they were throwing their leaves out anyway, and couches, and garbage, because they knew when the loaders would come by. So it was a decision made by one of our public works directors, let's, let's provide better service. Let's try and get some organization here. And we allowed people just to do it. They were doing it anyway. We got to sweep the streets. Another question. The only thing that leaf collection cost me is that sometimes I might get an extended construction season where I could run for another week or two. Well, then what happens is the asphalt plant shut down. So it's maybe costing me a week or two weeks where I could still be paving or doing other asphalt activities. But when the plant shut down, that really limits what we can do. So we got to do leaf collection. We got to clean the streets. Okay. I get that question for years. <clears throat> so another big, another big process that we do is milling and paving. Uh oh, what the hell was that? Anybody know how to fix that? All right. So <laughs> this is also a much appreciated service that we provide. I just wish I could do more. This was 23rd. Anybody drive 23rd Street? No? Wow, okay. 23rd's been a thorn in my side for years. <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. And the reason it is, is the bottom, what, three quarters of it doesn't have curb on it. Well, I've always heard, well, there's a CIP. We're going to do 23rd. We're going to put curb and sidewalk in. Well, we haven't been able to get the funding for that. Well, you don't want me to go out and put down asphalt on the street and then have it all be torn up and rebuilt the next year, right? So I held off. Well, this year I finally had enough. I said, we're going to do something with 23rd. I don't know when it's ever going to be funded, but I did it. And we went, and we didn't even get all of it because we ran out of time. I'm hoping to do some more. So the funding, whenever it comes, hopefully it won't be for another like five or ten years. But uh, that particular job, oh, I skipped slides. How did I do that? Anyway, I don't know if you noticed on the bottom there was B-A-R-S-S-A. -S -S That's the Bridge and Road Safety and Accountability Act. That's a new gas tax that was implemented in 2017. Bumped up gas, what was it, four and a half cents per gallon diesel, one and a half cents. And that's a, a statewide program. And all the different cities get a portion of that based on centerline miles. The first year we had 750,000. This next allocation, we're at 1.1. What's interesting about this, that this does not directly go into anybody's budget. It's project based. Streets uses some of it. Traffic services uses some of it. We might get some big projects done with it. You just have to submit a project and then the state will reimburse us with another gas tax. This is another one. Tourists pay for this one too. Well, we all pay for it, but the tourists are also sharing in that one. That's a tremendous bump. $1.1 million you saw in my budget. That's, a, that's gonna be a huge benefit and we're gonna put it on your streets. We're still, it's only been around for like two years we got lots to do. Uh, one of the other things, chip sealing. This is my favorite maintenance application of all the things that we do. Chip sealing the streets like painting your house. What happens if you don't paint your house? Well, this is basically painting the painting the street with a lot more grit. Yes. Is there a new uh, bump to the gas tax being proposed for the city? I just heard about there's going to be a, a new one being proposed. Uh, I think that's in the work, yes. 
2017? Um, that was the statewide one. The one you're referring to would just be a local. Okay. Okay. Good question. Uh, so this is Grandview. This is one that we did. Oh, what was that last summer? I think. Uh, notice the street's kind of gray now, but I don't know if you can see. What the chip seals do is they protect new asphalt from water infiltration and UV deterioration. Plus, in the wintertime, gives you an excellent traffic service. Okay, especially on hills. If it was up to me, I'd chip seal everything. I do get some complaints from people that are bicyclists, but it, it usually <laughs> lasts for a year or so. <laughs> well, they don't like riding on it. it but I, I get it. I mean, the first year, they're, or two years, they're choppy. <laughs> But then after a while, you don't even know they're there. This is what happens to the sun and the chips will get pressed into the asphalt. But it's a huge benefit. It protects our investments. And so what I like to do, if I go and overlay a street, the next year I like to chip it. And then we strike. It can cause some issues, loose gravel before we get it swept up. Sometimes the paint doesn't stick very well the first season. Next year we have better luck. And it's a quick process. We can just fly with this. Yes, sir? When you chip seal, how long does that last Depends on the track. Five to seven years on main routes, residentials, 20 years. I've, I've got off the streets even older than that. You can still see the old chip seals. So. All right, next one. I apologize if I'm going too quick. So, you know, there's four seasons in Missoula, but there's actually five. Pothole season. <laughs> Some people might call that spring. <laughs> we actually patch potholes all year round. It's one of our huge efforts. The only time we don't patch potholes is if all the guys are out plowing snow. Uh, so far since July 1, 3,500, my goal is one day that I can say it's zero. How about that? I'm sure it'll never happen, but I can dream. <laughs> uh, so that's only, you know, since July 1. It'll probably be more by July 1 next year. But we are making some headway. Uh, I, I'm using a high performance cold patch the last year. Last year I started using it, which we saw a definite improvement. We didn't have to go back and repatch. We've also had our asphalt recycler, which I'm steering towards using more in the summertime. We can make asphalt for about 25 bucks a ton in that instead of having to buy it at the hot plants for a bush at 50 in the summer. I do like this new cold patch in the winter. The only problem with it is it's 300 bucks a ton. So it's expensive, but if I don't have to go back, and fix them over and over again. The problem with potholes is, see this patch right here, and then see, we call this alligator tracking. Mm -hmm. So we can patch this, but then what happens is, the reason there's usually potholes is because there's a water problem. Water problems are not good for asphalt. Every one of those cracks will take water. Freeze thaw cycles that Missoula is so famous for blows them up. So then the pothole will be here and there. So even though we patched it, we always have to come back. The fix to this, and most often, is an overlay or a full reconstruct. This street doesn't even have any curb. So what I get in, in some of these residential areas, there's no curb, there's no sidewalk here. Should I go and dump 100 grand into this street, let's say for three blocks with no curb and sidewalk? What do you think? Yeah, I don't think so either. When will curb and sidewalk come in? You know, your guess is as good as mine. Those are expensive. A lot of times the homeowners have to pay for that or through RSIDs. So what we have to do when I go out and do stuff like this, I gotta fix the worst of the worst. Or if I do send my paper out, I gotta fix the bad spots. Just because I don't have a choice. Some of my streets in town are gonna look like they're back on the wagon trails again. But we get to a point we gotta do it, like 7th Street, Eaton last year, 2030. We gotta go out, we gotta fix them, we gotta do something. Alright, then it also helps save on pothole cuts. Next one, alright, another one. Alright, winter. Was the priority map after this, or? <laughs> All right, there's there's a there's another map that shows our priority system. I don't know any of you guys ever see me on local news talking about winter stuff. But if you do, just change the channel. <laughs> it's not one of my more fun activities. So usually, what they ask me is, how was the snowstorm? And I explain our priority system where we have ones, twos, and threes, which are main routes or ones, reserve, Higgins, Brooks, Hill Streets, Garrett, Rattlesnake, Grand Creek. We hit those first. That's the first place my guys go. Then we have twos. Those are bus routes, streets with hills, curves. Um, those are seconds. When the ones are done, the guys in their areas will then go to the twos. Threes are the next step, which are normally streets that are hills, lower traffic volumes. 60, I think around 60% of all the streets in Missoula are priorities. Well, then we got the low volume residentials. Those are about 40, 40%. Historically, 
we wouldn't even get the residentials until all the priorities were done. Okay? So then what happens is the residentials are being driven on for the three or four days or a week that it takes us to get the priorities done. Then we get ruts. And then when my plows do go into residentials, how do they work on packed snow and ice? Anybody? Yeah, wonderful, don't they? <laughs> they don't do worth a damn. The reason is I couldn't get to them for a week. I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but little, here are just some budget numbers on how much I spent, 355. Oh, de-icer, who asked about it being uh, the contaminant? Is that you? All right, so meg chloride, any granular or de-icer product I use is approved by the health department. They test the wells, the sumps. So anybody, and it, it's kind of nice because vendors will call and ask me, well, why don't you use this, why don't you use that? I say, okay, call the health department. It saves me a whole bunch of time on phone calls. <laughs> and believe me, the health department runs them through the ringer. So last year, or was it last year that you ran out of uh, sodium or, or calcium chloride and, and switched to sodium chloride? No, we used mag chloride and I tried salt brine for about salt half brine. the season. Yeah. yeah. And so they test for the salt brine to a Yep. Part. Yep, because MDT has been using salt brine for years. I thought I'd try it. Had mixed results. I went back to mag chloride. Good question. All right. So let me get back to priorities. So last year, oh, here it is, here's the priorities. This is on our website, reds are ones, blues are twos, greens are threes. So last year, this was a major improvement. I requested, actually I, I requested more than I got, but that's not all. But I got four additional FTEs, <laughs> full-time employees, and I want to thank all of you for that. And the reason I did was that those problems with the residential areas, ruts are, were just a nightmare. Last year they killed me. Drifts, horrible. So now, with these four additional FTEs, we put them out on the streets in the residential areas, plus I reallocated one of the employees. I now have five employees that work from eight to four running pickup plows so that they can get into these residentials immediately. They don't have to concern themselves with priorities. We divide it up to the city. We have a, a list of residential streets divided up in areas. Those guys come to work at 8 in the morning, that's what they do. You might see them if they're driving over a, a 1 or a 2 that they don't touch. Well, they're not supposed to. Okay, so this is the first time ever that we've been able to do that. And it's, uh, admittedly, this winter has been not too bad. I know, I know. But they all take, you know, of course, the, the biggest snow event of the year is the night before my presentation. Uh, well, I will say we've benefited greatly from the warming temperatures here in the last couple of days. However, we've received a tremendous amount of positive feedback on it. Now, admittedly, five plows doing 40% of the streets, we're not going to get everybody. It still is going to take us some time, and it depends on how much snow I get. You know, let's say three days on, on the upside on just like a three or four inch snow event for these guys. Yes. Where is it supposed to shed the snow and how to avoid you know, blocking parked cars? And Great question. They're not. They have no choice. We block driveways, mailboxes, and park cars. When these guys are plowing, there's... Dennis has 22,000 water service connections. There's probably a driveway associated with every one of those. Can you imagine us trying to turn the plows 22,000 times? Eventually, you run out of anywhere, if we even tried to do it. We would never get done at any sort of reasonable time frame, let alone you got to carry the snow somewhere. So if I, let's say we clear your driveway, then what are we going to block the hell out of your mailbox? Or if we try to open your park car, then we block the mailbox and the driveway. We don't have time for it. We have to just go. I wish Shane was in here with the county. I actually live in the county. They plow my driveway in all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe me, I get it. I don't ever call and complain. No, we don't have driveways like on my street. It's just like oh, cars getting yeah. blocked. It, so it, not so good. Well, <laughs> and there's nothing we can do about it. And I, I, I understand. Yeah. That's why I was just curious what the like goal was. I guess the goal was to just... We, we have to rely, and believe me, I get phone calls just like that for years, and I believe me, I understand people's frustration. So with that program, the reason I chose the 8 to 4 was would you rather shovel a berm when you come home from work or before you have to go to work in the morning? Probably when you come home, right, you have your kids help you before dinner. <laughs> when we've gone into residentials in the past, we were plowing them at night, people woke up, couldn't get to work and my phone and my email and our office lit up like Christmas tree lights, but not in a good Christmassy way. Okay, so that's why we do it that way. 
not perfect. I'm hoping maybe I can get a few more of these plows, get a few more guys out there so we can continue to improve that snow plow response. And last year it was huge. I mean, we, we were held under the micro or the microscope last year. And deservedly so. That was, that was a tough year. Yes? I guess mine is the opposite in that, like, I don't feel like my street ever gets plowed. And I see that there are some um, streets that don't have a color on there. Are there streets that you're like, you're just never going to go down? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not put up the residential snow map. It basically looks like the same thing with all the colors turned off. Okay. And then the residential streets are just kind of, I think they're black, kind of bold. And it, it is on our website. So if you go to the City of Missoula website, go to Street Maintenance, you can see all that. You can see if your street's one of our residentials or a priority. Now, as I, I said, it's a priority. It probably is. <laughs> if you've never been there, probably yeah. not. <laughs> now, I do get phone calls. People ask me why I don't plow in Clinton and Turner and Lolo on occasion. Those are outside city limits. Um, private streets, if you live on a private street, we don't do those either. Okay. But yes, for years and years, there are streets, maybe they got plowed once a year, maybe they never got plowed. We're trying to fix that. And we're trying to get rid of the ruts. Remember last year when you have the, the three ruts and you had to share the one in the middle? <laughs> That's not a good deal. So, we're working on it. I want to thank all of you. We've had some success this year, although we haven't been tested terribly hard. Um, but it will come. Plus, the other thing, these additional folks in the winter, I pay for them in the winter. Oh, no, that's the stormwater guys. That's the two guys. Um, but we also use them in the summer, too. <coughs> Huge help. I have plenty to do all times of the year. All right, next one. I kind of beat that one up. <laughs> all right, stormwater management. So prior to creation of the stormwater district, it was all handled by streets. And... We would go out and we'd address pooling. We'd get calls on them, we'd see them, we'd go out and suck them out. Then we'd put them on a list for cleaning. Prior to the stormwater district, we'd get maybe one or 200 a year. 6,000 subs do the math on what the life cycle or the maintenance cycle is. We'd like to have a five-year cycle. So when the stormwater district kicked in, they contributed two new FTEs, two streets, where all they do when they can clean sumps, they go clean sumps or stormwater inlets. We've never been able to do that. The only time we'd ever really go out and clean sumps is when we weren't having to patch potholes or pave or sweep or chip seal. It was just kind of fill-in work. And, or if you know, we didn't have enough guys or whatever. So it, it wasn't that we weren't doing any maintenance. It wasn't enough maintenance. And yes, a lot of it was reactionary. So now we're starting to get it where we are getting and achieving a regular maintenance cycle. So last year we did... Uh, 516 and I'm hoping to get two more I'd like to get another factor and two more guys I'd like to do at least 12 to 1500 a year and get on that five to seven year plan that's what we're shooting for those are from June 1st yes now one thing with the sumps we will suck them out we'll clean them out sometimes they're full all the way to the top um, all that material goes over to a water type settling pond over street division the liquid settles out we clean out the sediment take it over to the treatment plant Water and salt, or excuse me, water goes to the treatment plant, solids go to the landfill. Okay, with that, I also test those solids before the landfill will take them. They may be test them for BTEX, dissolved hydrocarbons, and what's the other one? Anyway, basically everything that comes off a vehicle. All right, the only place they can go is to the landfill. Miscellaneous concrete work, so uh, 5th and 6th Street. Anyone driven on that lately? Mm -hmm. All right, so we put a lot of effort into this. We upgraded ADA ramps. We put in new sumps. You can see that's a new one with all new ramps, patch it back. We did this project so that we could qualify the condition of those two streets where they would satisfy MBT standards for a maintenance overlay. MBT has all these rules on it whenever they'll do anything. It drives me nuts. Fifth and Sixth Street were <laughs> scheduled for their pavement pres preservation projects. $1.1 million, but 5th and 6th and several locations did not meet their standards. So, Street Division embarked upon improving the streets to satisfy their standards. We put in about, oh, 300000 with sumps, ADA ramp upgrades, two signals. Jeremy, if I remember right, I think so. Detection. Yeah, signal detection. Yeah, upgraded some signals. We did it, although today I got a call we missed one on 5th. I got to get that done. <laughs> 
So if this project is going to happen this summer, MDT is going to pay for full asphalt overlays from Higgins to Russell on 5th and 6th. Huge benefit. Huge project. I don't know that I could ever do a $1.1 million project any other way. The guys, the guys just worked extremely hard. We got it done. I mean, it took most of the summer. I had two to three guys working on this all summer long. So they got 40. And, and actually, the 47 included some other ones that we had to do, too. South Avenue with Dennis and the water crew, um, that was a tremendous effort. Dennis paid for the asphalt. We did all. We did some self installs, upgraded ADA ramps. We will continue to upgrade ADA ramps and keep going with this. You're going to steal it? Yes. <laughs> well, actually, fifth and sixth, no. Actually, they're not. They're going to go with another method. I have mixed feelings on it. They want to go with the 3 eighths state high grade mix that is really tightly consolidated, has a lot of oil in it, and it, it's a lot better at preventing water infiltration and UV deterioration. And plus you don't have the, the mess of the chip seal and then you'll have to wait to strike. The only thing that I'm concerned with is this is something kind of new. They're doing it on Russell. What did I tell you chip seal's doing the winter for you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but fifth and sixth kind of gets a lot of more a lot more bike traffic now, so there's give and takes and everything. The only thing I'm concerned with is how long is that new asphalt going to last? It's not going to be painted like your house, right? So if they put down epoxy paint on it, epoxy paint lasts five to seven years. Will the asphalt with that amount of traffic, will it last as long as the epoxy? MDT seems to say yes. I hope they're right. Now, we can still cover chip seal it, but once that epoxy paint's down, and that epoxy paint's horribly expensive. That might be a couple hundred thousand dollars in epoxy state or epoxy paint. So what happens if Brian comes along and chip seals over it? Then he's I gotta go to his office. <laughs> so there's give and take. I'm kinda interested to see it. It's MDT's money. They want to support just doing the, the thin lift in lieu of the chip seal. So anyway, yes sir. Question. What was the big difference between the ADA upgrades in 2013-2019 on Higgins and fifth and sixth that they tore all the ramps out again? Uh, those were just done. That so those those were done those were done by uh, MDT and probably was the specs changed. Mm -hmm. So have you seen the ramps that don't have these truncated domes in them? Right. They don't have them. They're out of spec. I don't know all the details of them. That's what I saw. Well, I guess my point is there are so many other areas in the community, such as around Bancroft Ponds that need ADA ramps, yep. and we go and we take... Hundreds of them, thousands of them. So, but we, my point is we take the, you know, all of this effort of tearing out ones that are six years old to upgrade them. So the ones you're referring to, that's up to MDT. Those are MDT routes. Those have nothing to do with bankrupt is not an MDT route. So Neither is 34. So just to, to layer upon that, so when, when we are just maintaining these MDT routes, we have to do what MDT wants. Correct. In order for them to pay for it. All right. Good question, though. Um, all right, I'm, I think we're getting close. Crack sealing, this is another one of my favorite maintenance activities. 196 hours, I would have liked to triple that. I'm hoping now with our additional staff we can get a lot closer to that. All right, questions. I flew through that. <laughs> I got a quick one. It's sure. Because I believe in to see something, say something. And sure. If, on, on these crosswalks where there's a ADA ramp coming from the street to a center divider mm -hmm. over to the street. In my neighborhood, this, somebody's cleaning out the middle. Yes. And why is it that, I mean, to me, for them to stop and clean that section out just in the middle and not as you get up to the, the sidewalks, they don't do that. And no. So that the, so the, the sides are dependent on the adjacent property owners. And we can argue about it, but I won't be able to tell you anything different. So it's part of the sidewalk deal. And I, I would say everybody does it, but there's just so many of them the city has to rely on the adjacent property owners. Because the ones out in the street, I mean, who's going to do the center one? The homeowners? That doesn't make any sense. But as far as our whole sidewalk snow removal program, as I'm sure you're all aware, the adjacent property owners are supposed to do it. So, and I don't want you folks out in the center of the street. Yes. So, a quick question back on the traffic signal. So, what prompted the recent change to reprogram the signal for an unprotected left instead of a green ball at the flashing yellow arrow? Is that a federal thing? 
Uh, do you have a location, a specific location, or yeah, that's a, Jeremy, do you know that's about a, that? That's a new standard. It is a federal standard. It comes from, from okay. the MUTCD, which is the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So okay. it, it's something that's being implemented na nationwide. Okay. It is a little bit different. It's well, it's kind of weird that it just happens and nobody knows how to, what, what you're supposed to do and when. Yeah. yeah. So those have been driving for 35 years or so, you know. Yeah. It's, just, it's just weird. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just different. Yeah, so it's showing up. It's intended to indicate that you you have you have a it's called a permissive left. You can you can go when there's when there's a gap. Yeah. Um, but you have to yield anyway. It's coming, so that's the yeah. yeah, So how do we learn? Okay, how do we? Citizens Academy. Like, how do we teach us, us folks, that the people that don't know that? Okay, if you think about you, let us know. We know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, my, my daughter just went through driver's ed and just got her driver's license. And I, I, I always think, you know, we should put everybody through driver's ed about every ten years. <laughs> <laughs> there's all these new things that happen. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So St. Thomas and Miller first. It's uh -huh. um, narrow, it's steep, and it's an affordable angle. On the um, stop sign call, there used to be a mirror to help you see what traffic was coming from. Oh, a fisheye mirror? Yeah, and it's gone. Will really? It replaced? Let me check into that. Okay. I didn't realize it was gone. gone. And I drive up Miller Creek every day. <laughs> <laughs> and not St. Thomas. It's gone. Um, let me check into it. I don't, that may even have been put up by a private property owner. I'm no. not sure. Is that an MUTCD? I don't know that one. I don't know. Either. Let me check in. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, question here. Uh, is your responsible for maintaining the railroad crossing? Uh, specifically over by uh, Cooper Street? Railroad. So MRL is excellent to work with. So anything in between the tracks, they won't even let me touch it. Going right up to it, I can pave right up to it. The problem with railroad tracks, every time a train goes by, they move. Mm -hmm. And we still have a lot of the old wood ones. Some of them have asphalt in the middle. MRL is great about putting in concrete. We're going to do three on Cemetery Road here, hopefully early this summer. Um, if it's in the center of the track, MRL would have to be the ones to contact. And They're usually really good about it. I was just going to add to that. I just learned that all the MRL train crossings have a number on them. If you go to the sign with X, there's a number of that crossing. So if you call them and talk to them and give them that number, they'll know exactly which one you're talking about. I have to do that for one for different reasons. <laughs> but they're tough. And the concrete ones are definitely the preferred way, but they're expensive and they they work on them as they need to, but it's entirely up to them when and if they do this. So. Yes. Any more traffic circles in the works? And do you have any opinions on them? Since you're going to be a man of opinion. I don't know if that was a compliment or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, traffic circles, are you referring to the smaller ones in the residential areas, like in the university area? Yeah, smaller or large. The roundabouts? Yeah. All right. Um, my opinion on them, on them depends on which side of the maintenance <coughs> department I'm speaking on. Uh, if I'm in traffic services in our, in our safety team, I support them. The reason there's traffic circles and roundabouts is several reasons. They move traffic more effectively, like a, a full-size roundabout is Bruce and Tool. Remember when that was just the left turn and that was where street vision was? Terrible. Works well. Miller Creek, same deal. From a maintenance standpoint for street division, they're tough. They present challenges. Um, even trying to keep a chip seal off, the turning movement wears them off. Um, they're hard to pave. They're hard to, to sweep around. But how do you argue that if I'm slowing people down and they're safe? They, they, they help with pedestrian crossings. Um, we just did a little one in California, Wyoming, because people are going too fast. If you don't like traffic circles and ball bouts and don't want them, slow down. You see somebody, I said that on the radio too the other day. That's the main reason. <laughs> Um, one of the main things with 5th and 6th, why it was reconfigured, people were going too fast. And we have seen, and we're going to do more analysis on it, it's slowing people down. Um, yes, sir? Talking about exactly the one in Wyoming and California, I go that route several times um, a weekend, uh, and, and it's hard to see in the dark. So I'm not that fast, but 
<laughs> I went over it in a new kind of a day. And the next time I went over it again, and I think the third time I said, no. <laughs> remember that? Thanks for your honesty. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't really say I feel like an idiot, but no, no. And no, I eventually I said, can we do a citizen to rest? <laughs> <laughs> but I was wondering, and I talked to Bob Delano, he said, oh, they are there, because usually they have something in the middle, you know, and then he said, it's so trucks can go over. Big trucks, that's why it has nothing built on it. So the reason that one wasn't made as insurpassable as some of the other ones, um, because we didn't have enough width, the fire department wanted it to be more accessible for them to drive over without taking out their springs. But could it, buy, could it be that something reflecting around? So We're working on that. Okay. Um, we've tossed around the idea of painting the gray, the curb around it in yellow. Yeah. Ready? I think we should probably do that. But <laughs> <laughs> I won't do it again, I promise. <laughs> very, very, very good, good feedback. Thank you. I cover it all the time. You bounce right over it? Not me, because you can't see it. And then when it snows, yeah. you really can't see it. And, and we're supposed to plow the top of it. And I'm not entirely sure that's getting done like it should be. And the reason is for fire. So. I didn't want you to feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we, when we, so when we put that in, I have to admit that that more of a ramp style curb was something that I came up with to help with fire. And MBT is actually done it at their big rocker truck stop. And the, there's trade offs in this business, and that was part of it. Instead of it being you know a conventional kind of a lay down with a big lip on it, which fire doesn't like those. Well, this was a compromise. Well, that's true. And so after we got that in, now, there's always a learning curve with these things. We always expect it takes a while for people to get used to it. That's all. But we went out there, and Mr. Pancake and I sat out there in the truck, and we watched, you know, eight or ten vehicles. I think out of ten, I think two people were like you and the gentleman in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, eight, eight, the other eight, they slowed down. Um, and there's, there's. Some other improvements we can do with maybe putting some islands in there. Right now, they're only painted islands, and that was my idea too. Because when the islands come in, if I ever need to do any maintenance on that street, what do I do? It's traffic. Those islands prevent me from shifting people around. But there's some other things we can do. That one was kind of an experiment. We called that one an urban mini. So it's not it's not just a conventional traffic circle, but it's it's something we're kind of experimenting with to slow people down. So far, I think it's been fairly positive. But feel free to comment. Oh, a round of applause for you. <laughs> All right. Next week, we're back at City Council Chambers for the MRA and Development Services. So, we will see you there next week. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.